week's episode looks at a plant that has been in the style doldrums for quite some time. The African violet, aka Saint Paulia, is the kind of plant that you probably imagine your nan growing somewhere in a dark corner. Not something that perhaps you would want to be including in your oh so stylish houseplant collection. But think again, because African violets are on the way back up. These plants are starting to be recognised as one of the most wonderful houseplants. I admit I've been a sceptic in the past, but I'm quickly coming round to the view that these plants deserve a place on the ledge. My interview today is with Annie Breek, who has her very own African Violet podcast. Annie is a member and a judge of the African Violet Society of America. She started growing seriously in the late 1990s and her collection has been growing ever since. I start the interview with a bit of a confessional to Annie about my love-hate relationship with the African Violet. I have to admit, Annie, that I, until very recently, end of last year, I hadn't had an African violet in my possession since I was a teenager. They were plants that I, was one of the very first plants that I grew as a teenager, getting into house plants and a child. But then at some point, I kind of went off them. I have to be totally honest with you. Sure. Uh, Despite my love of many of the other members of the Gesneriad family, um, and I guess there is a bit of a, an unfortunate stereotype that these plants mm-hmm. have somehow accrued that they're kind of little old ladies plants, which I hate that I hate the phrase little old ladies mm-hmm. anyway. But mm-hmm. this idea that they're sort of sitting on a doily, you know, looking kind of old fashioned. How do we go about countering that stereotype of African violets? And, and tell me about why you love growing them. Well, I think that's a really good question, and I wish I could answer it definitively, but I can't. But I can give you my thoughts on it. I think that African violets have an undeserved reputation as being difficult to grow. And so I think that 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 keeps it with that stereotype of the, you know, that your nan grew them and that that they're not a, a, a trendy or cool plant to grow now. But they are seductive little plants. You know, once you start growing them, they kind of suck you right in and you begin to really enjoy them. And I, I began, like I said, I began to grow probably in the late, late nineties, 1990s. Um, but my, I had tried multiple times before that to grow. I was given a leaf of an African violet in college and given completely wrong directions on how to propagate it. And of course it rotted and died. I was given an African violet years later as a gift. I could never get it to bloom again. And then I discovered, I have a green thumb. Like you, I love houseplants. I'm sitting in my sunroom now, which is filled with houseplants. And I thought, this cannot be rocket science. I have got to be able to grow these. And I rescued some from a local grocery store called The Jewel here. It would be like going to Tesco there and grabbed a, a bun- uh, three of them and brought them home. And the internet was just getting started uh, at that time. And I discovered well, you know, there used to be something, I think it's still in existence, America Online. And I really learned to grow African violets online. So for me, they were never a little old lady plant. They were not, my, my grandmother didn't grow them. Both my grandmother and my mother uh were actually uh, my 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 mother was born in Belfast in Northern Ireland, and uh, my grandmother and my mom loved they loved outdoor gardening. I was always the indoor gardener, so you know I I do think people think they're difficult to grow when they're when they're not. There is a trick uh, to that, and uh, because most people buy them in a store, and they overwater them and they die, and then they think well. Maybe you have to have a lot of time to grow these, and mostly people who are retired have a lot of time, and I think that's where part of that stereotype comes into play. Yeah, I think that's very true. That we do, we do sort of. I think a lot of people try these things once, and then, as you say, they just think they're doing the right thing by keeping that watering can moving, mm-hmm, <laughs> and mm-hmm. then they think, "Oh no, this is all too tricky." 
I guess that they're very wide, still very widely available I, in the US as they are in the UK. Yes. Uh, you know, over here, they're often, you know, you can often see trays of them in garden centres and also in supermarkets and places like that. They are still being sold. Um, but they're never one of those plants that when you see those kind of trendy plant write ups, they're never <laughs> very rarely mentioned in there, which I think is a shame. I, I think actually the whole Gisneriad family is missing out on in this in this front i agree tell us annie your your top tips for african violet success the thing to remember the most about them is and that and there is a little trick if you buy one in a store at least here in the u.s if you get a violet at what we call like a big box store garden center or a uh, we have them like at the local home depot which is like a building home supply place but the majority of them come from large commercial growers. And when they're grown in a greenhouse, they're grown in a very heavy peat moss mix. That's to keep them stable, first of all, in the greenhouse situation, but they ship them. And that's to keep the plants stable in the pot so they don't fall out, get dirt everywhere. And if you know about peat moss, which I'm sure you do, Jane, it it holds water. And that's why it's so easy to overwater them when you buy one from a big box store because it's in an almost solid peat moss mix. Best thing to do is take take it out of the pot, gently remove as much of the mix as you can from around the roots and repot it into your own potting mix, which can be a commercial African violet mix. You don't have to have a special one, but you can get a special one. I think I'm sure there are places in the UK that have mixes just for, you know, gisneriads or blooming house plants. But generally speaking here, you would then, even even with that mix, you would cut it with perlite so that it's an even lighter mix and you have much less chance of overwatering the plant. But for the most part, African violets like the same conditions that we do. They don't ever want to be too hot or too cold. They don't want to be in a draft. They like bright but indirect light, and they don't like having their feet wet for any great length of time. <laughs> so that, that's that whole, the, the most common reason that an African violet dies is that it has been overwatered. And the most common reason that it doesn't bloom again is that it's not getting enough light. Yeah, I think my my one African violet that I currently own, I think this is what's wrong with it at the moment. It's it's not getting enough light, and also it definitely needs some new potting mix. Uh, I've been I've been somewhat ignoring it over the winter time. It has to be said, um, and I've been mm-hmm. thinking about getting some specialist African violet compost, but I know actually I could probably just make up my own fairly easily. Uh, the one that I went for, Annie, is called Max Black Jack. It's a dwarf one which came from Dibley's in the UK and it did flower last year. So I'm looking forward to it flowering again. It's got these very, very dark, Mm -hmm. uh, inky, purpley red flowers. And the foliage, I think it is meant, I hope it's meant to be slightly variegated because it does seem to have sort of darker splotches on it. So unless I've just, (laughs) maybe I'm doing something terribly wrong with mine. I'll look it up while we're talking so I can tell you. I'm reasonably sure it's variegated. I like that the fact that you can get these very, very tiny, almost sort of teacup African violets, because I remember as a child having some African violets that could get to a fair old size. In fact, I saw one on your on your website, a variegated one Mm -hmm. that looked absolutely enormous and totally gorgeous. Tell me, about, I'm talking about the one where um, at the top of your post from February the 1st, uh, how, to li- how to limit your collection, which made me laugh. Tell me about that wonderful variegated St. Paulia. Well, you know, that, that plant is called Jersey Snowflakes, if I'm not mistaken. It's stunning. And, you know, African violets, as you said, they come in all different sizes. The ones you generally find in a a garden center or a a big box store here are what we call standards. And there are standards and then there are large standards. So standards like to be repotted ideally every six months. Minis, Minis and semis like Max Black Jack 
is a semi, if I'm not mistaken, it wants to be repotted every three to four months. So uh, a lot of people love the minis and semis. I am not particularly a good mini and semi grower. I've always considered myself a standard grower. I like the standards better. Uh, to me, minis and semis are a ton of work. Uh, I'm good if I can keep my collection uh, at a manageable uh, size and repot my standards every six months. I'm a show grower. And so for me, consistent care is really, really critical. And when you don't repot regularly, then you struggle. So I took so many leaves off that giant uh, variegated plant that it's going to struggle a little bit. And I, I potted it down into the same size pot and it will come back, but it won't be ready for show now for another year. Two things that come out of what you've just said. One, re talking about repotting. So we've talked about the, the potting medium. What kind of pots do you have your African violets in? Are they plastic, regular plastic pots? For all my plants on my light carts, which I grow my plants on light carts. I grow them under fluorescent light. I did try LED lighting. And in fact, uh, I just made the decision. I, I did that for about nine months. And I decided that in my growing conditions, LEDs are not ideal. My plants prefer my old school they call them here T12 fluorescent tubes. And uh, so I, you know, I, that's, I use regular pots, regular plastic, because that's what I have to show in. But I generally also grow at least one violet in a window uh, using a self-watering pot, a ceramic one, because that's how most people who aren't show growers, grow them. I believe you know Dale Martins, who I spoke to about Streptocarpus, and she was waxing lyrical about self-watering pots, which convinced me to give them a try. It's a really great way of watering if, like me, you're worried about inconsistency and I'm, yes. terribly, I'm a terribly inconsistent waterer. So that's, that is a top tip. What, what direction is your uh, windowsill facing where you have your African violets? Is it... Um, Presumably not south facing. No, although you could grow in a south window with a little bit of adjustment. Generally speaking, as I mentioned before, African violets like bright but indirect light. I have grown violets just on a windowsill in the past. And in my experience, they like a north, an east or nor, nor, east northeast exposure. That seems to be ideal. And I would usually say, I would say I probably have them about a foot from the window, anywhere from six inches to a foot away from the window. In the winter, when it gets cold, now in my sunroom, the, the windows are new, but in my, the main part of my house, they're old single pane windows. So, you know, in the winter, that cold on a windowsill, you would have to move a plant away from that. It will get too cold in the winter. So I do that easily here if I have it on a light cart or if I have it on a stand by my window, I just move the stand back a little closer into the room a little, you know, if I think it's going to be too cold, which I did during the polar vortex. Just explain, I, I, I think I know what you mean by a light cart, but can you just explain what that looks like for any listeners who can't picture it? Uh, it's a cart on wheels. Mine are two foot by two foot wide i you know they're, so there's they're tall square towers is what they look like mine do and uh again I, you know i'm not metric so <laughs> don't worry <laughs> you'll have to trans you'll have to translate that for everyone jane but they're two foot by two foot and they have four shelves and then they have light fixtures for each of those shelves and on each fixture i have two fluorescent tubes and i use what are called grow lights those type of tubes that here in the U.S., they were often used um, for aquariums. They kind of have a bluish cast to them. I like the way they make my plants look. Other people use soft white, warm white, cool white, or a mix of those type of fluorescent tubes. I just prefer the grow light ones. And the carts are movable. They, each light fixture plugs into the one below it, and then I plug that into a timer and into, uh, you know, a safety strip that plugs into the wall. And 
you, obviously you're you're a, a doyen of the show bench. What are, what are the show, showers trying to do now? We've obviously got this incredible variegation, which is really coming to the fore. Are there any other trends in African violets that are coming through in terms of flower colour or leaf colour or size? I'm not a hybridizer. I'm just a grower. But I think that a lot of people, you know, there are a lot of people in Russia and Ukraine and in that part of the world that are hybridizing for some really stupendous blossoms, very large blossoms. Uh, and I've seen some really beautiful plants come out of there. And for me, as a show grower, I look mostly for foliage. And what I see are mainly more and more people want to grow minis and semis. There are, you know, I, I heard, I listened to your episode about plant hoarding mm-hmm. recently. And I, I myself just did, um, you know, an episode of, and talked about limiting my collection and shared my notes on how I do that on my website because it is very easy to end up with way too many plants. So I think a trend, though, that I see are a lot of people really want to grow more plants, and they want their space limitations, send them toward the minis and semis, because they can grow more plants of that size in the space that they have. Um, Variegated plants have been around for a while. There are different types of variegation some more popular than others. Uh, I think that mostly what I see when when I go to show or when I'm judging a show, show growers are very focused on the foliage of the plant. And for regular violets that are not trailers, that's all about the symmetry of the plant. They grow in a rosette shape, as you know. So you want to have them have very few gaps in the foliage and have them look look very sharp in that way. Trailers, of course, have multiple crowns and they are judged on their form rather than their symmetry. Some of them grow, they trail in a line. Some of them trail like a snowball uh, with multiple crowns. Uh, You know, I think every hybridizer, I'm actually growing some new, uh, some new uh, hybrids for Dale Martins, who you, who you interviewed recently. Um, She has some new plants and I'm growing a few of them out in my growing conditions. And, you know, I'm going to stop just for a moment because it's worthwhile to say this. All of the info that I share with you about how I grow and the things that I use, these are the things that work well for me in my growing conditions here in the Midwest, in the United States, in the Chicagoland area. I grew, the first place I grew very, you know, very seriously with Southern California. My growing conditions there were completely different than here in the Midwest. So I'm sharing what are generally known as best practices with you. And there are, there's, there's a lot of a wealth of information out there that pretty much what I'm telling you is what's going to work for you where you are in the UK, but your water is going to be different than mine. Your potting mix which I think you guys call compost, right? That's going to be different different than mine. And these things all make a difference. And so you just kind of play and figure out and see what looks and works best for you and your growing conditions. Indeed, indeed. I think that's very true. And uh, to, talking about, you're talking about the, the foliage and symmetry and so on. How do you keep mm-hmm. the foliage looking really nice? Uh, is water going onto those leaves is obviously a no-no, I presume. What are the ways of keeping the foliage looking really nice? Because whenever I repot, I end up with a plant covered in <laughs> in flecks of compost. And then I'm <laughs> thinking, oh, gosh, how do I tidy this up? Well, um, actually, there are a couple of things. But the easiest way to tidy that up is... It happens, believe me, it's not just you. It happens every time you repot. It happens to me every time I repot. And what I do is I wait a week or so until I know the plant is resettled in its new pot. And then I have a very soft paintbrush. And it's a it's not a natural bristle brush. It's a synthetic one, and it's extremely soft. And I rest my hand under the leaf. And I use this soft paintbrush and gently, it's like, it's like you're dusting the leaf. 
and you just brush that pot, that, that compost off. And that is the easiest way to do that. But to keep a violet looking good, remember we, we mentioned that standards do like to be repotted about every six months. And you'll often see the lower leaves of a plant may start to yellow or maybe start to droop a little or just not look like they'd never got, they start, the other leaves start to get larger. The newer leaves seem larger than the older ones. So you, you do some grooming. You take those older leaves off as you go and as you're looking at your plants. And by the time you've reached about that six-month point, you've begun to get maybe a little tiny neck on your violet. That's your clue. It's time to repot because you don't want to end up with like a palm tree, <laughs> you know, with a big long neck with this big thing on the top. So you want to repot. And more often than not, you're going to repot back into the same size pot. Generally speaking, the standards that you buy at a garden center or a big box store, they're in a four inch pot, which is, if I'm not mistaken, about 10 centimeters they will be repotted back into the same size pot. That's really interesting because I think this is where I've been going wrong with my streptocarpus in that I kept potting up and up and up until they ended up in these enormous pots. Uh, So how do you go about, is it a question of root trimming? Yes. Um, If I have a pot, a plant, which, for example, let's just go with Jersey snowflakes. It was very large and I took 31 leaves off it. That left about an inch and a half neck, which is a pretty big neck, because I didn't repot it in time. It would never have been that big if I repotted it on a six-month schedule. Uh, So that amount has to come. You have to be able to set the pot, the plant back down into the pot enough to cover that neck. So that generally does exactly mean that you cut some of that root ball off. You've already taken all those leaves off. The plant doesn't need all the roots that it had. So I just gently, I have a pair of scissors. I gently cut that off, get a clean pot. If I want to reuse the same pot, I will wash it. I happen to wick water and I put a layer of coarse perlite in the bottom of all my pots. That gives me a little bit of insurance uh, that my plants are not going to get soggy feet And then I set that plant back down on top of that and then add more potting mix back up to the top and let it go on its merry way. If I take nothing else away from this conversation, that is a brilliant tip, which I'm now going to be taking to heart. Well, and violets are usually hybridized to be a certain size. So a regular, like I said, they usually come in about a four inch pot. And with regular grooming and consistent care, they'll stay in a pot that size. If you were propagating from a leaf, you're going to start in a little tiny pot and move up in size till you get to a four-inch pot. And generally speaking, most most standards are never going to go bigger than that. I happen to like growing large standards. It's kind of It's very gratifying when you grow a plant that big and you take it to show and it's really in full, full bloom and has a very strong head of blossom. Um, But again, it just depends on the plant, how it's been hybridized. It's hybridized to have a high high bloom count. You hope so. Uh, Minis and semis are going to stay in smaller pots. Minis uh, generally about a two inch pot, maybe. And a semi, maybe two and a quarter. Wow, that's that's small. That's really small. Maybe two and a half inch, yeah. Small, 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 small. Uh, the minis and semis, they don't, you know, as we look at them for show, a mini uh, is in diameter, uh, the, the diameter of its leaf span, not more than six inches. A semi, not more than eight. And most standards are probably around, you know, 12 inches or more. Of course, that one you saw in on my website, that took up an entire two foot by two foot shelf all on its own. We'll be back soon to answer some of your African violet questions with Annie. But now it's time for question of the week. 
And this week it comes from Whoa Nelson on Instagram, who has a Tenanthi Lubbersiana, which I'm reliably informed by the RHS website has the common name Bambaranta, which I've never heard of before. But anyway, this is a beautiful variegated prayer plant in the same family as the Marantas and the Calatheas, and its leaves are variegated with creamy areas and green striations, a very beautiful variegated plant. But this question concerns the white bits on the leaves, which have brown patches on them. And Wah Nelson wants to know if that's because the creamy bits are less robust than the rest of the leaf, which is green. Great question. Well, the simple answer is yes. I checked with one of my wonderful helpers at On The Ledge, Nathaniel Oles, who is one of the moderators on our Facebook group, Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge, because he has some expertise in this area. And he told me that, yes, the browning on the white sections of the leaves is due to the fact that these pale areas are more subject to sunburn. And it makes sense when you think about it, because the chlorophyll that's in green leaves, that helps to protect the plant from sunlight. And of course, in areas of the leaf where there is less or no chlorophyll, there isn't so much to protect the leaf from the power of the sun. Unfortunately, once the damage is done, there isn't anything you can do to get rid of that burning mark on the leaf. That will stay where it is. As the leaf ages, it will eventually fall off and be replaced by new leaves. So you can just trim it away, provided there's lots of other foliage growing. And this should be an indication that the plant needs perhaps a little bit more of a filter on the sunlight to stop it happening again. Bear in mind that a plant sitting in a very sunny spot in the winter may be absolutely fine, but as day length increases and the intensity of sunlight increases as spring arrives, that plant may become very unhappy in that spot and damage is more likely to occur. So do bear that in mind as we come into spring in the Northern Hemisphere, or indeed as we head into autumn in the Southern Hemisphere. But it's also worth noting that variegated plants do need a decent amount of light because of course they don't have overall as much chlorophyll as a normal plant. So if you have a member of the Maranta clan that has got all green leaves, it may be able to cope in shadier conditions than a variegated one. And if you put your variegated plant into deep shade, you may find that it responds by throwing out all green leaves in protest. So as usual, it's a bit of a balancing act with house plants in terms of getting the light right. But the more you keep an eye on your plants, the more you'll observe changes which indicate when the plant is unhappy more quickly and be able to fix the problem. If you've got a question for On The Ledge Podcast, you know what to do. Drop me a line at ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. Tweet me at Jane Perone. Contact me via the Facebook page or indeed send me a message on Instagram as Whoa Nelson did. Sorry, I just can't resist that name. And now let's get back to my chat with Annie, where we start to find out how to increase your African violet family. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the sew along. I will be talking about equipment for the sew along before the end of the show. Let's talk about propagation. This is one of the joys of African violets is they just are so easy and so fun to propagate. Tell us how you do it, Annie. Well, uh, most African violets will bloom true to their registered description. And this, again, only really important if you're a show grower. Uh, But you can take a leaf from one of your plants and you can propagate it and grow babies and have more more babies of that that same plant that will will grow from it. It's kind of like cloning, really. And the things that you, you will need, you need your potting mix and a pot, a small one. And you'll need, if you have a, a domed tray, like if you are used to propagating, maybe you start seeds indoors for your outdoor garden and you'll have a domed tray that, you know, makes a little like greenhouse for them indoors. That's great. If you don't, you can use a Ziploc bag, you know, a sandwich bag that you can close up and make its own little individual greenhouse. So you take that leaf. You also need a sharp edge either an X-Acto knife or a single-edged razor blade, and you'll make a sharp 45-degree angle cut on the stem 
type. I usually slice a bit off the top of the, of the leaf as well. In theory, that's supposed to stop the leaf from thinking that it's growing and it makes it think, oh, I need to make roots and send out babies. Whether or not that's true, I, I can't say for sure, but I do it as a matter of course. So I would slice off that top and you cannot use just scissors. You have to use that sharp razor blade edge to make a sharp, clean cut. Otherwise, it will the stem of the leaf will rot. But I use the same uh, medium that I use, the same potting mix that I use for my violets, I use to put leaves down. And I use uh, little plastic cups that are like three ounce cups. And I, I uh, put a wick in them and make holes in the bottom, put a wick in them, put a layer of coarse perlite, just like I do with my plants, put some potting mix in, use a pencil to make a a hole in the middle, put the leaf in there, water it in, and put it in the bag and leave it in a warm place on my plant stand where it's getting light and uh, let it grow and it will grow. Some of them are faster than others. It just depends on the plant. But the next thing you know, you have little mouse ears coming up through the soil and uh, and you've propagated your first violets. That's a, such an exciting moment, isn't it? And how, lo- how long is it from doing that, from seeing those first leaves to getting that new baby to flowering how long does that does that take i would say that takes longer to get the leaf to once you have babies that can take anywhere from eight to 12 weeks you know it depends on the plant again and then once you have to let it grow you have to let the babies grow till they're big enough to be removed from the mama leaf and potted up on their own and then you need to let them grow and bloom uh and then decide if you like them and want to keep them and pot them on and, and grow them. For standards, it can take up to a year, I would say, to get to that point. That's another reason why people are so keen on minis and semis. You can actually get a mini or a semi into show shape in about six months. I, uh, you really can if you you know have the right the right conditions and you are very focused and do everything you need to do and take care of it and keep, you know, repotting it every three to four months once it's in its pot and and to go. So it can take a little while. There is some patience involved, but uh, the rewards, I think, are worth it. And in the grand scheme of things, compared to some other flowering houseplants, that's not a great amount of time anyway. That's, uh, yeah, that's quite quick, really. And, you know, they bloom all year round. It's not like they're, particularly if you have a light cart like I do, um, like a lot of times at Christmas when I know I'm before Christmas, if I know I'm then not going to go to show anytime soon after that, I'll put my plants on a, what we call a pre-show schedule that is about 12 weeks long. And, uh, I will disbud them until just before Christmas and they will come into bloom at Christmas time and have be this beautiful secret garden in my sunroom in the middle of this cold, uh, winter snow and it's really quite wonderful when that happens so they will uh they will bloom all year long they, they're not particularly dependent on the seasons now i had a few listeners weigh in with some questions which i wanted to oh. ask you about um okay one of whom was asking about feeding african violets whether there's any tailored feed that suits these plants or if they're okay with general house plant feed that you might be plant feeding to any other kind of house plant? It depends. That's one of those questions. This could go a, <laughs> a couple of different ways, um, and which is often the case with African violets. Things can go one way or another. Um, I, the commercial, I use, a, I personally use a commercial potting mix and it does not have fertilizer in it. But the, for my big box violet that I repot into a commercial mix, That commercial mix comes with a six-month time-release fertilizer. So if I'm using that type of potting mix, and I don't know if that's available in the UK or not. But if I'm using... Most houseplant mixes would have some fertilizer in them for... Yeah. Okay, so if you're using a mix that already has fertilizer in it, then you do not need to use any other fertilizer because where African violets are concerned... In for, with fertilizer, less is more. So it, you do not want to be watering like with a another fertilizer on top 
of a, a potting mix that already has fertilizer in it that is time releasing over a specified period of time. Here, it, they usually say it's good for six months, which works great for the standard African violet because it wants you to repot it in six months. And then you're getting a new batch of potting mix that has fertilizer in it. So you don't need to add any more. But if you're using a professional mix, like I use for my show plants, then yes, I'm using a water-soluble fertilizer that I get from Optimara, which is a large commercial grower here in the United States. And I water uh, with that, you know, the box says, use a, a teaspoon per gallon. Well, I use a quarter of a teaspoon a gallon, and I water with it every time. So, but if you're using a potting mix that already has fertilizer in it, you don't need to add, you don't need to do anything else. That's a good guide. I think that's always worth checking in. That's something that I think with many different houseplants, people forget to take into account. I think most potting mixes here in the UK would include some kind of fertiliser and it should say on the packaging, but I find potting mix packaging and labelling very confusing. I'm sure it's the same in the US. There's so much yes, information that you it struggle to find the relevant thing that you're actually looking for. So, yeah, you have to be a bit of a, a sort of a sleuth to find to find the relevant piece of information yeah. in the packet. It's very different. Yeah. You don't know. Indeed. You don't always know. Indeed. Yeah. Very true. Next question comes from Jen, who wants to know about those um, spots that are sold specifically for growing African violets with a reservoir whether they're necessary. From the sound of what your convers- we've been saying so far, it doesn't sound like they are, although I guess they do make life easier. They're not necessary, but for the, for the average grower who wants to just have a few violets in their home to brighten up, you know, to have that beauty of a beautiful blooming plant in their home, a self-watering pot makes life, can make life a lot easier. And if you are if you travel a lot or if you're just a very busy person and you have trouble keeping on a good watering schedule, a self-watering pot can be very, very helpful. I think that that's true. I found a few plants, not actually African violets, but begonias and things that I just couldn't keep happy. As soon as I put them into a self-watering pot, they sorted themselves out and they were absolutely fine. So I think it's definitely worth a try if you're struggling with a particular plant. And something to mention about the self-watering pots as well. Generally speaking, for them, just like anything else, you want the mix to be a little bit lighter than what comes out of the bag. That usually means adding perlite to it to lighten it up a little. Uh, Yeah, you don't want it to be too claggy in there, that's for sure. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly it. And I had a tale of woe from somebody called Elizabeth who says that her African violet keeps dying every time the season changed. And she thinks that it's because humidity levels were were rapidly or dramatically changing as the seasons changed. And she thought that was killing her African violet. Does that sound oh. like a, 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 a realistic scenario? Or I mean, what's the main reason people kill their African violet? Is it the usual well, overwatering? It- The usual, the most common reason that an African violet dies is it's been overwatered. And without knowing more about her growing space and without seeing maybe a picture of her affected plants, it's hard for me to give a definitive answer. But generally speaking, my guess is that it's possible she was growing on a windowsill and winter arrived, the heater turned on. The furnace went on and, you know, your your climate is not as extreme as where I live, but when the furnace goes on, the air gets dry. And if it was by very close, like on a windowsill close to a window and it got cold, it might have just shriveled up. It's hard to know. It's hard to know. But if it is a humidity or lack of humidity issue, something she could try is grouping a couple of plants together on a tray with pebbles in it, small pebbles. You can buy, you know, clean pebbles at the, you know, at a a, a supply store of any kind, and then uh, put water in the tray. The water's not hitting the bottom of the pot, 
but it's creating a humid atmosphere and it's as it evaporates for this little grouping of plants that are sitting on that, that pebble tray. So that could be, that would be something to try if it really is humidity related. If she finds um, that her, that the leaves are turning sort of brown and glassy and mushy looking, that to me says um, it's been overwatered and it's rotting away. The roots are not getting enough air because violets not only need potting, the potting mix and the fertilizer that they get, they also need airspace for their roots. Otherwise, they drown. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's as we all the things we've been saying are, are on those lines from from adding the perlite and making sure that the there's, yeah. there's plenty of uh the, the soil doesn't kind of settle around the roots. All of that helps to aid that air, doesn't it, getting to the plant? Definitely. Yeah. Um, and Alyssa's question kind of relates to what we were talking about earlier. She wants to know how to keep African violets in a tidy shape. Presumably that's just a case of removing those leaves as the rosette grows from, from the outside. Yes. Do you have to use a, a chart? I've got a terrible habit of just kind of like snapping them off. Is that a really bad idea or is that OK? No, that's the right thing to do. That's exactly the right thing to do because African violet leaves will snap right off at the neck, which is where you want them to go. So you would uh, slide your hand, particularly on a standard, you can use your hand. You have to use your fingers if it's a mini or a semi, but you can kind of put your hand underneath there, get a hold of the stem of the leaf that you want to take off, and then you don't just yank it straight out, but you want to kind of pull it over to the left or to the right and it will snap off right at the neck of the plant and the leaf comes right off. You make it sound so easy, Annie. <laughs> it is. It's easy peasy. Yeah, no, I'm sure, I'm sure that's true. And um, what, let me just look at my questions again because I've suddenly lost my train of thought thinking about snapping off leaves. Um, so, so humidity, <laughs> we don't really need to worry. Uh, apart from uh, things like the, the heating going on, they're not, they don't need mad high levels of humidity, do they, African violets? No, 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 I don't think so. I mean, obviously all plants and all humans like to be a little more humid than dry, you know, but the only time I really, where certain plants, I am growing a gesneria, one of the cousins of the African violet. Um, there are a couple of those cousins that do require humidity. And in my conditions, they have to be grown covered in a, in a bowl or a dome of some type so that they have their own little greenhouse effect. Otherwise, they will shrivel up and die. But in my experience with African violets, both with hybrids and with species plants, they, they're growing here in Chicagoland in the middle of winter in the middle of a polar vortex with two furnaces going. One of my furnaces does have a humidifier on it, but I also grow them. They are together. They're near each other, which always helps with humidity when you have plants that are grouped together. Just like, you know, you see any greenhouse, you know that. It's humid in that greenhouse because there are a lot of plants all in one space. So dome tray, you really are only going to use that for babies when you are propagating leaves and growing babies. That's about it. Annie, thank you so much for joining me today. I've learned so much. Oh, you're so welcome. It was my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I hope that's inspired you to take a fresh look at the African violet perhaps if you're a dedicated grower of these wonderful plants it's given you a new enthusiasm to try some different ones do check out my show notes where i've got a list of books and resources recommended by annie and details of the african violet society of america which is definitely worth a look if you're an enthusiast for these wonderful plants don't forget, if you're interested in finding out about my Patreon campaign, details are also in the show notes. Find out how to get your hands on an exclusive digital artwork by the aforementioned Nathaniel Oles by becoming a monthly contributor to On The Ledge on Patreon. And now let's get on with the On The Ledge Sew Along Part 2. Let's begin by talking about what we call in the UK seed compost but what you might know in other parts of the world as seed starting mix. So in other words, the stuff that you're going to sow your seeds into. 
It's important that you get a good quality seed compost or seed starting mix because this really is the base from which your seeds will start their growth. If you try to use some other kind of potting mix that's not designed for seeds, this tends to be much more bulky and particularly tiny seed will really struggle to germinate. The other issue is that seed starting mix should be a low nutrient mix. And this is because seeds, when they start out, they've got everything they need inside that embryo inside the seed coat and they don't really need much in the way of nutrients when they start growing. Of course once you prick them out and move them on as they start to grow they probably will need a more nutrient rich compost but for the minute as they're starting out and germinating seed starting mix is what you need and that does tend to be low nutrient and tiny particles which allow air in between them. The roots need air as well as as moisture but particles so small that they won't impede the progress of the shoot as it emerges. Depending on which country you're in, there will be lots of different choices on the market. Go for a good quality one. It isn't really worth skimping on this stage of the game. If you have seed starting mix from last year, the official advice is to put this on the compost heap or use it as a mulch because it's best to start with fresh. I have to admit, I have sown seed in old, in inverted commas, seed starting mix, and it's been absolutely fine. But really, if you want the absolute best start, it is best to grow with fresh seed mix. What else do you need? Well, not a lot, really. You can sow in absolutely any kind of container, provided it's got some drainage holes. So if you're trying to reduce, reuse and recycle, you might be using some meat trays with holes in the bottom that you get in the supermarket or ones that come with veggies in them. Uh, they've already got holes in the bottom and sometimes you get a top with them as well. So you can use that as a mini propagator. Or if you're a little bit more fancy, you might have an actual heated propagator. The one I've got is called the Garland 7 and it's a plastic base with seven individual seed trays with their own little clear plastic domes and underneath that tray there are electric cables which keep the compost at a temperature of around 18, 22 degrees centigrade which is just about right for many house plants to germinate. You can buy one of these quite cheaply online or in your local garden centre. If you don't want to splash out on one of those, the best course of action is to put your seed tray, either cover it with a plastic bag and seal that up, or if you've got one of those aforementioned plastic domes from the supermarket, close the lid down on those and put them somewhere warm and sunny but do keep an eye because if the seal isn't completely tight then you will find that evaporation occurs from the soil and it will dry out quite quickly in warm environment. If the seal is pretty good you should find the condensation lands on the glass or the plastic and runs down and goes back into the soil. Labels are always useful. I really let myself down last year with my cactus sowing in that my labels were so rubbish I now don't know which baby cacti are which which is not great so do try to label everything I tend to use a white plastic label and use a permanent marker pen to write down exactly what the seed is and when I've sowed it other things that are worth having, well, if you're sowing really tiny seed, then something like horticultural sand or silver sand, as it's also called, is really useful for mixing with those seeds ahead of sowing so that they could just so that they're a lot easier to sow than if you're trying to sow this tiny bits of dust. So you mix the, the seed into the sand and then you sow that on top and you don't put anything else on top of the seed. Perlite and vermiculite are also really handy for seed sowing. If you're sowing cacti and succulent seeds, then mixing in generous amounts of perlite into that seed starting mix is definitely worthwhile just to aid the drainage and make sure that it's really sharp and those seedlings aren't going to rot off. Vermiculite, well, that's a substance that holds water. So if you want to put that as your final layer on top of your seeds, that's useful to have around. You can plant some seeds just in pure vermiculite, but of course you have to be a little bit careful because they really do have absolutely no nutrients and will need moving on to some proper potting mix quite soon after they've germinated. And really, that's about it. When you get to the stage of pricking out your seedlings and getting them onto the next stage, which 
which will take a very long time in the case of cacti, which usually need to sit in their seed tray for, well, about a year. But if you've got something a bit more quick growing, then you will need to prick those out. And you can buy little dibber devices, which you can use for making holes for bigger seeds. And at the other end, they have a little prong, which you can use to prick out seedlings. Personally, I prefer to just use my hands because I can really feel what's going on. Remember, when you're doing that, never touch the stem, only touch the cotyledons, those first set of emerging leaves, because really they've served their purpose of getting the seed started. And if you damage those, it really isn't the end of the world. Whereas obviously, if you damage the stem, it's game over for that seedling. One other option, if you like gadgets, there's something called a pro seeder, which allows you to sow seeds one at a time. It's like a tiny set of handheld bellows which you expel the air from and then place the tip of the pro seeder against the seeds and it will pick up just one seed which you can then lift over and sow individually. I've not used one of these personally but I have heard people say good things about them. So if you find that you're a bit of a butterfingers or like me you have big fat sausage fingers then it might be something that's worth looking at. Whatever equipment you choose to use, the main thing with sowing seeds of any kind, including houseplant seeds, is that you just pace yourself. Don't take on too much in your very first year. Just try a couple of different varieties to get the hang of things before you go in all guns blazing with 15 different varieties of cactus or coleus. And in next week's show, we'll be getting down to the nitty gritty of actually sowing your seeds and waiting for that all important and exciting moment when they germinate. Remember, if you're posting anything about the On The Ledge Sew Along, use the hashtag, hashtag OTL Sew Along on your Instagram posts, Facebook posts, Twitter posts and so on, just so that I can see it. If you're not a member of Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge, that's a great place also to go and share your progress. We're a friendly bunch. All you need to do is go and answer the three questions. And please do answer them because I can't let you in until you do. And you can join our wonderful group. That's all for this week's show. Have a great week and happy sewing. Take care. Bye. music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, and Overthrown by Josh Woodward, all licensed under Creative Commons. See my website for details.